Alright, hi everybody. I'm going to teach you today how to build a desktop. I understand if you're watching this, you're probably someone who's really fed up with the costs of laptops nowadays and you don't really care about mobility, you just want a computer to have in your house under a desk somewhere where it's never going to be moved and you don't want to have to pay a premium to have one pre-built by a company, say a, a Dell or HP. So you've come to the realization that building it yourself saves you a ton of money and you're able to get a lot of power that will last you for several years without having to pay such a high price. And I'll be happy to inform you that it really is not that hard. All you really need is all the components, know what they are, and know how to put them together. So before we begin on the process of how to build one, first let's talk about what parts you need. For the process. First thing on the list is you're going to need to get a case. Now cases are usually pretty cheap. You can find one for as little as $20 online or you can get ones that are much more advanced and end up costing close to $200. So right here I have a fairly simple Cooler Master case that I've had in my house so I'm going to be using this for a demonstration. Now next and possibly the most important part of your desktop is the processor. This is the piece of hardware that's going to tell your computer everything that you're wanting it to do and make everything happen. So these can be very expensive or they can be somewhat cheap. They can pretty much cost anywhere between say I'd say $60 and almost $1000. Now as you can see there are tons of little pins on the bottom of this. So you have to be very, very, very delicate when you're handling this piece of hardware. It's possibly one of the most fragile and most expensive pieces that you're going to use when you build your computer. So for my suggestion, when you're buying your parts, try to put more of your budget towards your processor because it's going to show you the most performance for what you pay for. Now next we have the motherboard, which is going to hold all of the main pieces of your computer together inside the case. So, for your motherboard, as far as budgeting goes, you don't need to get the most expensive one. You can find ones as cheap as $40 and upwards towards $300 or $400. And as the price goes up, usually just more functionality is added, more possible ways you can expand upon what you put in your computer. But for most people's cases who just want to build a cheap yet powerful enough computer, you can go with a smaller, cheaper motherboard. Just make sure that the technology that it supports is up to date because a motherboard that uses older say memory or processors is not going to help you very much because it's already behind. So just keep that in mind when you're buying your parts. Now the next piece of hardware we have is memory which is also called RAM or random access memory and what these pieces of hardware do is when you tell your processor to do something the data that is involved is moved from your hard drive, which stores all your data, to the memory where it's actively exchanged with the processor to do what you want it to do. So the main goal you want to have with your memory is to have enough to keep up with what you're doing on your processor. And nowadays with Windows 7, the recommended amount is between 4 and 8 gigabytes of RAM. Now for this purpose, I don't have Windows 7 that I'm going to be using on this demonstration. I'm just using a simple server software, so I only have four half gigabyte sticks of RAM, which come to a total of two gigabytes, which will be good enough for this scenario. Now, notice that there is a small notch in the slot that loads into the RAM, and these are different for several different types of memory. And so you need to make sure that the kind of memory you're buying is the exact kind that the motherboard you have takes. The newest right now is called DDR3, but there's also still DDR2 and DDR technically 1 floating about in the stores. So you want to make sure that you get the right kind that is compatible with your motherboard. All right, now I mentioned the hard drive earlier, so that's what I'll be talking about next. The hard drive basically is just storing all the data that you use on your computer. It stores the operating system, whether it be Windows or Linux or Mac OS and it stores all your files and everything that you need on your computer. Its sole purpose is just to store everything. It doesn't actually actively use the data for processing. 
That's the RAM, that's the job of RAM. So what you're looking for in your hard drive is basically just as much storage space as you think you need. And nowadays hard drives are very cheap. You can get a one terabyte hard drive, which is a thousand gigabytes, for just a little bit over seventy dollars. And this is after a major flood in the in the factories that build all the hard drives. And prior to that, you could get the same hard drive for a ridiculous amount, say, you know, forty-two dollars. So really, space shouldn't be too much of a concern because it's so cheap nowadays. In this scenario, I have a somewhat older hard drive, which is 250 gigabytes, but it'll be good for this demonstration. Now, I wanted to mention, if you notice that I have all these components sitting on these bags. So, you're probably wondering, you know, what's the deal with that? So, basically, I'm putting them all on these bags because they prevent electrostatic discharge, which, in other words, is static electricity. Uh, computer po components are very, very suspect to being damaged from shock whether it be from you touching them and having the static electricity jump between your finger and the components or just when you set them down somewhere and it causes that to happen. You really want to avoid that. So luckily when you buy these components they're already wrapped in this anti-static uh, bag material. So you do not under any circumstances want to throw away these bags. Keep them and when you're building your components set everything on top of these bags and make sure you don't let them sit on any other kind of surface, especially carpet. As you can see, I'm kind of building on carpet, so I'm being extra careful in putting everything on top of these anti-static bags. And you should definitely do the same if you don't want your expensive new parts to be destroyed before you even get to use them. The next piece of hardware we have is actually somewhat optional for most of you. It's a dedicated graphics card, which basically just displays everything on the monitor for you to see that the computer is doing. Now, almost all computers nowadays have onboard graphics on the motherboard. So you can plug your monitor straight into the motherboard and you can see everything that's going on. But there's still some motherboards out there that don't support graphics, which in fact the one that I'm using for this demonstration does not. So I definitely need a graphics card to see what's going on on the monitor. And for some people, even if they do have integrated graphics on their motherboard, they want more power, they want to be able to play intensive 3D games, and so they need a dedicated graphics card to do this. So that's what we have here, and we'll go into more of that later when we build it. Alright, and next we have the power supply, which is a little bit self-explanatory self because it just supplies power to everything on the inside of the computer. As you can see, right here is where you plug in the power cord that goes to the outlet on the outside of the computer, and all the wires that are coming out the back over there plug into the various components on the inside of your computer. And I'll talk more about those plugs when we actually go to build it. Alright, so the next pieces we have are your optical drive, otherwise known as your CD or DVD drive. And if you want, you can have a floppy disk drive. Now with the floppy disk drive, as you can see, any of you that are older than me at 18 years old would probably remember using these a whole lot. I, on the other hand, have never used one in my entire life. But if you need it, then you can still get them. They're very, 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 very cheap. Probably only about $10 to get brand new nowadays. So if you want one, you can go ahead and get one. And for your CD and DVD drive, there's a whole ton of different types. There's ones that only play CDs and DVDs. There's ones that can write CDs and DVDs or burn them and there's ones that can write and then rewrite. So they usually are labeled the right front. So this one in particular only reads DVDs and also CDs assumingly too. So with this disk drive you would not be able to burn CDs or DVDs. And if you wanted to be able to do that you would need a different kind of drive. So you want to make sure you read exactly what it is and what it does and make sure it fulfills your purposes. Alright this component is completely optional it's a Wi-Fi card in essence for your desktop so if you don't have access to an internet cable or you just want to use Wi-Fi on your desktop then you're gonna need to get one of these alright moving on you're obviously going to need a monitor so you can see what you're doing on your computer you're going to need a power cable for it and a power cable for the computer itself you're also going to need 
a VGA cable, which is that blue cable right there, or if it's a newer monitor, you might need a DVI cable, which is white. And usually these cables come with the monitor when you buy them, so you shouldn't have to worry about obtaining one. Next, you're going to need your keyboard, which everyone knows what a keyboard is. Type in your commands, comes up with the action you want. You're going to need your mouse. In this case, I have a trackball. And then I have a few other various parts. These over here are all cables and connectors for the inside of your case. These ribbon ones on top are for older components. A lot of the older hard drives and CD drives and floppy drives use these cable uh, connectors. But thankfully, a lot of newer components use these much easier to manage SATA cables. So you, you probably will see a combination of the two of these cables when you build your computer. Also right here, this is a power adapter for your power supply. You see the one end that's white, that's the older power connector on older power supplies that go to older components. Now the thinner black connector right there are for SATA controllers, which are newer disk drives and newer hard drives. They all use a different type of power connector, which is that. So these, this uh, cable adapter right here is very handy in case you have a power supply that doesn't have the right connectors that you need. And so this way you will be able to get power to everything that you need to. So moving on, we also have right here, this is a case fan. You need to install these in your case so that way you can keep all the components cool because computers get very hot. Now there's a fan that goes right on top of your processor which does a majority of the cooling but it's also nice to have a, a fan on your case as an exhaust to bring all that hot air outside the case so that way it doesn't get too hot on the inside. So for this demonstration I only have this fan but many cases have tons of mounts and you can go absolutely nuts keeping your computer cool and have as many fans as you want. Alright, so that takes care of all the main components you need to build your computer. Now let's just take a quick look at the tools that you should have. In essence, the main things that you only really need is a Phillips head screwdriver, all the screws that come with all the parts you need to assemble, and also this little tube right here. This is thermal grease, or thermal paste, whatever you want to call it. When we assemble the processor, we have to apply a little bit on top of the processor to, that sits in between it and its fan to keep from the friction heating up between the two components. And you'll see what I'm talking about when we go to actually build it. But this is my actual toolkit. It has several other screwdrivers. It has a couple of parts extractors, a tube for spare parts, but you don't need to go all out. The main things you need is a Phillips head screwdriver, the necessary screws, and that scringe of thermal grease. Okay, so now that you know all the pieces that you need to start construction, we can actually start the process of putting it all together. So what we usually start by doing is assembling some of the core pieces onto the motherboard before we put the motherboard in the case. So you usually want to start with the processor, which to me is actually the most intimidating part because it's such a fragile piece. And once that's over, then everything else is easy. So for this, you're going to need your processor, the thermal grease we talked about earlier, and also the fan that goes on top of the processor, and this always comes with the processor when you buy it. So you won't have to worry about getting one on your own. So to start off, you take the processor very carefully out of its case, and again, notice that it has these very fine connectors. So you gotta be very careful when you're handling it. You usually wanna handle it by the edges like this. And there's also usually a very small arrow in one of the corners. As you can see, it's right there, that silver arrow right there. That is going to line up with an arrow that's also on the mount for the processor. You want those two arrows to line up and that tells you you have it facing the right way. So, with a quick look, I 
I can see that the arrow is in this corner right here. So I want these arrows, arrows to line up. And first, there's a little lever you got to lift up and pull back all the way. Now, hold on. Let me, let me zoom in a little so you can get a better look. So you see this little, this little lever right here? You want to make sure that's all the way up. And then you take the processor and you lay it down very, very, very carefully. Now you make sure it's nice and snug. And then you take this lever and push it down and latch it in. So that's it. It's in. You can breathe again. <laughs> and now we just got to put a little bit of this thermal grease on the top of it. So usually you want to just put a very, very, very small dab on. Like, I mean, the size of a pea, because when you put the fan on it, it's going to spread out very quickly. So I'll just quickly make a little dab. And so that's that. Now, you take your processor fan, and they all usually have a weird, intricate way of locking in. So you have to take a weird look. So you see it has this mechanism here that you have to figure out. And in this case, what you do is you first set it down on top of the processor. Then you need to get one side latched, which can be a little bit difficult. All right, so one side's latched, and then you take this arm and you push it over very carefully. It's going to be a little tense, and it locks in. So now it won't come off. And there's also a connector that controls the fan and connects it to the motherboard. So you take this connector and you plug it into a little plug that's on the side over here. You see this little brown plug right here? plug that in right here and that is completely it you have finally finished plugging in the processor its fan and got it all hooked up to the motherboard so now we'll we can move on alright so next we're going to install the memory which is actually very 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 easy all you gotta do is pick up your memory stick and look at the notch right here and line it up with the notch that's on the slot. And by the way, these slots right here, these are specifically for RAM. They're for nothing else. So you line up the slots. You make sure these tabs are open on the side. Line up the notch and simply push in on each side and it will click. And then you repeat. You do the next stick. Push it in, click, click, and move on. Um, for this case, I have different types of RAM, different br different brands, and generally you don't want to mix up the brands. You want to get all the exact same sticks of RAM to make sure it's all compatible. But for this case, I already know that these work okay together, and I am cheap and don't want to buy more, so this is what I'm going to use. So plug it in, click, click. Last piece, in, click, oh, see, got to make sure you have it facing the right way, click, and click. Now, I want to mention, you see this thing I'm wearing on my wrist right here? Probably wondering what the heck that is. It's metal on the bottom right here, and so basically this keeps me grounded so I don't shock anything. So, it's kind of a nice thing to have. Um, one thing I want to mention about motherboards is, as you can see, I had four sticks of memory and they had, it had four lanes on my motherboard. Some of the cheaper motherboards only have two lanes, so you want to keep that in consideration when you're shopping for your motherboard in regards to how many sticks of RAM you can have. Alright, so now we're actually going to take our motherboard and put it 
inside of the case of the computer. So one thing you'll notice is there's all these holes in a weird arrangement on the bottom of the case. These are the holes that hold the mounts that hold up the motherboard. And so as you can see, I have these little brass mounts already in some of the holes. I went ahead and did this to save some time. And basically what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to refer to the manual that came with your motherboard and know which holes line up with the holes on the motherboard for the screws. So I've already done that. I've got the mounts in and so you'll have to figure that out on your own. It's not too difficult. You just got to look at the manual, look at the motherboard, figure out which holes line up and put in the little brass mounts. And if not all of the holes are there for your motherboard on the case, don't be too alarmed as long as it's still secure inside the case. That's all that matters. All right, so now we actually get to the part where we drop the motherboard into the case. Not literally, but figuratively. So you want to pick up the motherboard by its edges very carefully. Try not to touch any of the parts on the top or bottom of the motherboard. And so you want to make sure these parts right here are the plugins that you see on the back of your computer. So you need to line these up with the back of the case. And so you gently bring it down in and line up the holes that match up to the parts. Now this may be a little bit difficult. You might have to wiggle it a little bit, but you still want to be very careful because you're still dealing with very sensitive pieces. I think that gets it right there. So from here, you're going to get your handy Phillips head screwdriver and you're going to start screwing in the screws just as so. Be careful not to drop your screws on the motherboard and be careful not to scratch the motherboard or do what I just did, drop a screw on the motherboard. Try not to do that. It's not the end of the world if you do, but you know, the more cautious the better. And you screw them all in. So I'm going to go ahead and screw them all in and cut to the next scene. Alright, so now we have all our screws in and the motherboard's in place. So the next part is possibly the most tedious part of building a computer, which is hooking up the power button controls and the reset button controls and basically any of the controls on the front of the computer and hooking it up to the motherboard. And these all are very complicated. It's a bunch of little cables like this. As you can see, I got a ton of them. And the only way to really know where to put them is to consult your motherboard manual. And they're usually labeled, like for example, this one is labeled power SW which stands for power switch which is the most important one because that's the controller that allows you to turn on the computer when you press that power button on the front of your computer so for demonstrational purposes I'm only gonna plug this one in because it's the only one that will actually be vital to the fact that your computer will turn on or not so I'm gonna go ahead and plug this in they, they all plug in on a row called panel of all these little jumpers right here. And so, again, you have to consult your motherboard to find out where exactly these are supposed to plug in. But I know for a fact that this power switch plugs in right there. All right, so now we need to install our hard drives, which are going to go on in these rails right down here. These also can be used for floppy drives, so this case has a total of five slots where you can put either a hard drive or a floppy drive. In our case, we're just going to install our one hard drive. So, what we do is we make sure the hard drive has one side that has all the plugins that go to the motherboard. 
So you want to make sure these plugins are facing the motherboard. So you slide them in just like so. And then there's these locking levers that will lock it in place. But before we lock it in place, we need to spin the case around. And on the other side, there's actually some screws we need to screw in. So, without further ado, we line up the holes and screw the screws in. Now, a lot of people just screw in one or two screws just to get it in place so it doesn't fall out, but I think that everyone should screw in all four screws because the more snug that the hard drive is in its slot, the less it'll vibrate and the less noise it'll make, which is a complaint a lot of times people have is when their hard drive starts to buzz and vibrate inside the case. So a lot of simple cases will just have the two screws in the back and it'll have two screws in the front. But this case in particular, instead of the front two screws, it just has this sliding lock. So now it's completely firmly in place, doesn't budge at all. all right, so since we're already talking about these slots right here, we'll go ahead and put in a floppy drive for those of you who would care to give the time of day to put one in. Same procedure, you got your plugins for the motherboard on the back that you need to be facing the motherboard. And for these, you don't want to enter through the back because they're actually a little bit thicker on the front where the plate is. So you actually want to push them in from the front. So right here we have the slot for our floppy drive and we simply just slide it on in and get it lined up nice and flush and same thing as a hard drive we turn it over get out our screws and screw in the back side and now with the screws in there all we gotta do is take the tab and slide it over and that floppy drive is locked in. Alright, so now we'll go ahead and move on to our disk drive. CD, DVD, optical, whatever you want to call it. And those go in these larger slots right up here. So the procedure of installing it is very similar to how we did the floppy drive. And of course you want to make sure plugins face the motherboard. And we go ahead and slide it in. Make sure it doesn't snag on anything. Be careful when you're doing that. And we get it in. And same thing goes over again. You get your screws and screw in the DVD drive. In this case, I'm just going to screw them in enough to where it stays put for demonstrational purposes. Let me turn it back around, find the tab, lock it in. I'll go ahead and just lock all these slots just so it's all organized. And that's it for the front of case. So we have our disk drives and our floppy drives. So now we're going to go ahead and want to install our case fan. So that's going to go right here and you want to make sure that you line it up so that way the wind flow goes the right way. So by looking at this I know that I want it to be going in this way because that will pull the air out instead of pushing air in. So that depends on your preference of what you want to do but just make sure you have it the way that you want. It. So we're going to go ahead and bring this over like this, line it up with the holes and once again get out our handy Phillips head screwdriver Oop. and screw them in. So I'll go ahead and cut to the next scene for time purposes. Okay so now that all those screws are tight and as you can see the fan is in. 
And this is another item that you want to make sure that the screws are very tight because if they're a little bit loose, then the vibration can cause a little bit of noise when the computer is running and you want to reduce that noise as much as possible. All right, so now we'll move on to the graphics card. So if you're not going to install one of these, you can go ahead and skip ahead, but it's good to know how to put one of these in anyway. So basically, it's loaded by a slot and very similar to RAM and they go into a specific lane called PCI Express which is this orange one right here and it has a little tab in the back that you push up just like RAM and you simply line it up and press it in. Now a lot of times there's only a certain angle that they want to go in especially true for the really large ones but get in place and it snaps in and from there you get out your screwdriver again and you screw in a screw on the top of the case which is right here this holds the graphics card in securely and make sure that it doesn't pop out So that's in, and as you can see, here's the plugins where you plug in your monitor. So that's that. So now I'm going to go ahead and install that Wi Fi card for internet in the computer. And as you can see through here, next to the graphics card, there are these white lanes right here. These are our regular PCI lanes and what they are used for is any kind of expansion card for anything. There's cards that can add extra USB ports, there's ones that can add Firewire ports, or in this case, add a Wi-Fi adapter. So for me, this is a brand new part that I got. Nice and shiny, brand new. So what we're gonna do is bring it down to one of these lanes and Simply plug it in. So again, you want to be careful with everything. And it snaps right in. And now, right here is a plug that the little antenna for the Wi-Fi plugs into. So it's pretty cool. You don't need really any of these extra expansion cards to put in your computer for it to work. But if you ever come up with the need to add some extra functionality to your computer, that's what these lanes are for. All right, so now we finally pretty much have all the components inside the case for the computer. So now what makes the most sense is we need to put in the power supply so that way we can begin to hook up all the power to all the different components. So that's going to go in this slot right here. And you might not be able to see, but there's a little tab right down here in front of the motherboard that kind of helps you guide it into the right exact spot and also on the screws on the front of it notice they aren't totally rectangular they're kind of odd shaped so that also helps you to make sure that you line it up exactly how it's supposed to go so take that carefully make sure to hold one hand on the cable so they don't fly everywhere and slide it up like that and then that's when you turn the case around and once again get out your screws and your screwdriver and screw in the power supply now again this is another one of those components that can vibrate so you want to make sure that you screw it in extra snug to keep from that irritating vibrating noise and once you have all the screws screwed in, you will have your power supply. So, just one more screw. And that is in. So now we can start to actually hook up all the different cables on the inside of the case. All right, so for the first power connector that we need to hook up is this little square one right here. 
and that's going to plug into a little square port right down there. So, easily enough, plug it in, it clicks, and that's that. Next, right over here, right by the RAM, we have our main power connector. This is, as what it sounds, the main power that goes straight to the board and gives power to most of the components on the motherboard. So, we line that up and push down, wiggle it in, and it clicks in. And that's it for that. Now, we can hook up power with these to the hard drive. So, find one a proper distance way and wiggle it in. And that's good for the hard drive. Now, we do the same for our CD drives. We get our power cables. Oh, and here is where we need to use these adapters because these are SATA drives and they only use this thinner black power plug-in. So, we take the connector from the power supply and we hook up the adapter. Now, you have the new connector. And with the new connector, it's an L shape, so it's impossible to get it wrong. And you simply plug that in. And then, if you need another one, you plug that connector in, and you'll have everything hooked up. Alright, so as you can see, I have those two adapters on the power supply, so we have power going to the more modern disk drives, even though we're using an older power supply. Now back over here to where the hard drive is, connected to one of these power cables is a little bit different looking smaller connector. These are for the power for the floppy drive. And a floppy drive, if you remember, is down in here, but you can't quite see it because it's very short. So we take this connector and work our way down in there and plug it in. So that gives power to the floppy drive. Next, we need to get power to our fan for the case. So we pick up another one of these power connectors, connect them together, and we will have power to the fan. And that's pretty much it as far as connecting all the power. You just do a double check, make sure that you have power to the board in both that little four connector that we connected earlier right here, and also the main long connector. You have power to your hard drives, you have power to your floppy drives, and you have power to your disk drives. Once you have all that, then you're set to move on to having to connect your data connectors. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and start with the newer devices that use the SATA cables before we have to uh, crowd up our machine with the big fat ribbon cables with the older stuff. So if you can see these orange plugins right here, those are all the plugins for uh, SATA devices. So again, it's an L-shaped bracket, so very hard to mess up. You just take the cable and plug it in. And then you take the other end and that's where you plug it into the devices. So you take that and plug it in there. And then you repeat again for the next cable. So with the two SATA cables plugged in we now have data going from the motherboard to our disk drives. And now we can move on to the older connectors that are ribbons that connect to our hard drive and our floppy drive. Alright, first we're going to plug in our ribbon data connectors for the floppy drive, which is this little area of pins right here, right next to the expansion slots and the graphics card. So, we take our cable and work our way down in there to plug it in. And we wiggle it in, try not to push too hard, 
to where you bend the motherboard. And so now that cable is plugged in. So from there, we're going to plug that into our floppy drive. Now, this end of the cable, it has basically a male receiver, I mean a female receiver for all these pins, but it also has one filled spot right here. So you want to make sure that you line up the cable the right way so you don't bend a pen. So, line that up like this. And push it in. And now you have data going from your floppy drive to the motherboard. So right next to the RAM, and actually really right next to the main power connector, we have the plugins for our hard drives or CD drives that use these old ribbon cables. So when there's a little tab on the side right here that you need to line up with the box you plug in, push it in, and that's hooked into the motherboard. So now you take this cable and Go to plug it into the hard drive over here. Now, as you notice, as soon as you start putting these cables into the case, things get very crowded. So that's why I like to do these last. So that way you don't have to move around the cables later to plug other stuff in. So again, you make sure you have the tab on the right side. Carefully lift around other cables and plug it in. So now you have cable running from your, <laughs> can't even see anymore, hard drive to your motherboard. Okay, so if you made it this far, then you've completely assembled everything on the inside of your computer, which is great. So now what you need to do is look for any cables that are loose. Like for me, I have a ton of these cables from the front of the computer that are all end up loose. So you want to take these cables and kind of tuck them away somewhere where they're not going to rub up against other components or even worse get caught in a fan and stop the fan from working which would in turn cause the computer to overheat. So you want to make sure they're out of the way. So I'm going to tuck them in the slots back here behind our first hard drive. So that way they're completely out of the way and we don't have stuff all in the way of our PC. And one of the main things you want to watch out for is to make sure that no cables are getting close to the fan on the CPU. Because if any cable starts to get close to it, like say this cable comes down and rests on top of here, it can slow down the fan and that can cause some serious stability issues if the fan can't keep the CPU cool. Okay, now we have our computer assembled. So the next step is we need to close up the inside so that way, you know, dust doesn't get inside or, you know, you don't have animals start crawling in or something like that. So we need to have it all closed up. So we get the slides that come with the case. First you do the back. You kind of line it up, push it in, and slide. And once again, you get your screwdriver and screw in a couple screws, or even one is fine, just to hold it in place. Moving on to the next side, you get the next side panel, same thing, push it in place, slide it over, make sure it slides all the way in like that, and then you get a screw to screw in over here. And that's it. You have your finished computer. All nice and shiny and ready to go. So now we need to hook up our monitor, keyboard, power to the outlet, and our mouse. So let's go ahead and get started on that. Alright, so now that you have everything assembled on your computer, it's the easy part. All we got to do is hook up the cables between our monitor and our new computer and hook up our keyboard, mouse, and power to the system. And that's it. So, 
what we need to do is get one of these power cables and hook it up to the back of the monitor. So, carefully lift up the monitor and you'll see that the power plug is right here. So, take our power cable and plug it in. So, that in, we get out our display cable, which will either be this blue VGA cable, if you have an older monitor, or if you have a new widescreen one, it'll probably be a white DVI cable. Again, lift up the monitor, look for the plug-in, and plug it in. And they have screws on the side for you to screw in, so that way you know that it will stay secure. You don't have to screw these in, but I usually do anyway, just because I don't want to have to worry about my cable coming unplugged one day. And it takes five seconds to do it anyway. So, now you have cables for your monitor. So, now that you have the cables hooked up to your monitor, you take your display cable from your monitor and you hook it up to the graphics card we installed. Or, if you have onboard graphics, it'll be on those plugins at the top where your motherboard is. But in my case, it doesn't come with one, so I have my dedicated graphics card. So, we just line it up and plug that in and screw in the screws in the side, make sure it stays secure. And at the top where our power supply is, we get another power cable and plug that in. Next we got to plug in our keyboard. In my case, keyboard is a USB. Just plug it into the standard USB jack. But also, some older ones use these circular plugs right here. The green plug is for your mouse and the purple plug is for your keyboard if they use these inputs. If it's USB, then all you got to do is plug it in to one of the many USB jacks that you have right there. So for example, in my case, my trackball mouse is one of the older plugs. So I'm going to go ahead and plug it in to the green slot right here. And that's that for my mouse. So with your mouse hooked up and keyboard and monitor and power, you're ready to plug it into the wall and see if it turns on. So now just for giggles, I'm going to go ahead and see if it comes on. And ooh, in this case, it does not. But don't freak out because many, many things could have gone wrong and a lot of times it's a very simple issue. So in my case, the first thing I'm going to check is to see if I put that jumper right for the power switch. Because if I didn't put that right, then the switch is not getting the signal to the motherboard to turn it on. So I'm going to go ahead and cut off and check that, and we'll try again. Okay, so upon checking the power switch cable, I indeed put it slightly off. I was one pin off, put it in the wrong spot, so that could have been a problem. So now let's check again. And here the were, and it's working. So, there's a weird noise coming out, so something's probably vibrating against something else, but I'll figure that out later. But, as you can see, I had a problem, it didn't work, even though I've built tons and tons of computers. So, if it doesn't turn on exactly as it should the first time you hook it up, don't stress out, don't worry, just think logically, and first check the jumpers because a lot of times that's what people get wrong because if you're one pin off then it's not going to work so from there I would suggest to make sure all the power connectors are hooked up right and also check the RAM sometimes the order that you place the RAM in the slots it doesn't boot right for some reason I'm, I'm not expert enough to be able to explain why but sometimes I find if I switch around the order of the RAM and the slots, especially if you have different brands, then it fixes the problem. And from there, if you have any issues where you're not booting right or things aren't working, then go ahead and leave a message in the comments and I will see if I can help you out on that. 
in my very first computer that I built, it turned out that the motherboard I bought from Fry's was dead upon arrival. It was a bad motherboard, and I had to take it back, get another one, and then everything worked. So just go ahead and leave a comment if you have a question, and thank you for watching. Give me some good feedback, and I'll see you next time.